This program was recorded on July 8, 2016 on the main campus of Georgetown University, Washington, D.C. My talk this afternoon will be about George Washington, the businessman, entrepreneur, but I cast that in a fairly broad sense in terms of Washington's mindset, his attitudes toward money, toward the economy, toward entrepreneurship. And there are many details here that have yet to be uncovered. Uh, this book that I wrote, First Entrepreneur, is only intended to be a broad introduction to the topic. There's a lot of scholarship that, that needs to be done. In fact, we still don't know quite how much Washington was worth at the time that he died. And to try to place that into the context of the times, he's often spoken of at the time he died as uh, one of the wealthiest men in America. And I think that's probably true, but uh, work really needs to be done in working in his accounts, which is kind of the origins of this book in that uh, a few years ago, we decided to begin publishing all of his financial papers, which are quite extensive. Uh, tra transcribing them, annotating them, editing them, and then publishing them in digital form where they will be freely available online hopefully uh, later this year through the Mount Vernon website. Uh, so we began that, but the amount of detail there is, is truly immense. There's so much to be discovered, uh, not just about Washington himself, but about his family and, and about the Mount Vernon, Mount Vernon as part of a broader community of estates and of people. I mean, there were constantly people in all walks of life moving back and forth to and from Mount Vernon. Sometimes Mount Vernon was just a stop on the way from places like Alexandria to Gunston Hall to Kenmore, Kenmore to Belvoir in particular, the seat of the Fairfax family, as I'll mention in a moment. So you had enslaved people, you had workers, uh, you had farmers, you had Virginia gentry, men, women, children, constantly moving back and forth through these estates and carrying commerce and trade throughout Washington's life is one of the things that these financial papers document. And really a lot more work needs to be done, not just with Washington, but there are lots of other financial papers from uh, his contemporaries that kind of have been ignored. Historians look at them and they just see, oh, here are a bunch of documents uh, with all of these numbers and all of these little you know, accounts. What value could that possibly be? Actually, the value is, is incredible. Uh, for Washington, and Washington will be my focus, money was very important to him. From the very beginning of his young adult life up to the end of his life, it was in many ways a primary element of his thought. It was a motivating factor for his conduct both as a farmer and entrepreneur but also as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army, and then particularly as President, and I'll try to get to that. I was stunned, uh, jumping the gun a little bit, when I began reading his correspondence right before becoming President. Imagine this, Washington says right before he becomes President, to establish the national prosperity shall be my first and my only aim. That's his understanding of his task as President of the United States. And so I will discuss that uh, as much as I possibly can. Uh, on the background, now the Washingtons came to Virginia in the 1650s. Uh, there was a John Washington, uh, followed by his son Lawrence Washington, and then Augustine Washington, who was George Washington's father. Without getting into too much detail, uh, Virginia's basis, the basis of the Virginia economy at that time was tobacco and land. And that was how the first Washington, John Washington, was attracted to Virginia. He came actually to purchase tobacco and to sell it back in England. Uh, we owe the fact that the Washingtons stayed in Virginia to the fact that John Washington's ship sank. Uh, it foundered. Uh, just as he was about to head back to England. And so he did the first thing that Washingtons do, which is complain a whole lot. 
Uh, so that's, that's part of their, their MO, uh, generation to generation. But then he, he made the best of a di difficult situation, and he stayed in Virginia and became a, a businessman entrepreneur in America. Uh, first of all, by purchasing land. Uh, second, by making a good marriage. And I'll talk more about that concept of good marriage uh, in a moment when I get to George and Martha. But uh, certainly the Washingtons, both men and women, are remarkable for their partnerships. And the partnerships, and I mean that uh, advisedly, this is not just a matter of men plucking women and saying that she's the right choice for me, but it's a matter because the women were not just waiting there to be plucked. Uh, it was a mutual decision based on mutual attitudes toward the world and mutual goals. The Washington men and women tend to have the same sense that they want each other to be stewards of their wealth and of their inheritance and to pass it down from generation to generation. The men and women both tend to be, throughout generation to generation, very thoughtful, very diligent, sober, and determined people who work together. So John Washington built his wealth. Lawrence Washington, his son, continued that. Augustine Washington, George, George Washington's father, is usually a caricature. We only see him in the Parson Weems fables. He was actually a very savvy businessman in his own right, uh, and I can talk more about that if you like. But he died in 1743 when George Washington was uh, only 11 years old. Augustine Washington's second wife, who was George Washington's father, Mary Ball Washington, was a remarkable woman who I think is uh, really misunderstood uh, and unjustly maligned. She was very strong-willed, very intelligent, albeit poorly educated, uh, because women did not receive uh, good education in those days. But she imparted to George, after his father's death, these principles that really became fundamental to his ways of thinking. Principles such as sobriety, diligence, again, as we get back to those, avoidance of debt. Washington's horror of debt runs all the way through his life, and I believe that that came from his mother, and it came from his experiences of what he saw in, in Virginia society at the time. Now, the education that George Washington received, thanks to his mother, again, he didn't go off to England like many other young men did, partly for financial reasons, but his mother imparted to him a very practical, very nuts and bolts education. And this fit in perfectly with the qualities of Washington's mind. He was a detail guy. He loved study. He loved to see how things work on the, the very basic fundamental level. And what his mother emphasized for him was, uh, were such subjects as mathematics, geometry, accounting, um, and, and basic grammar and orthography, but much more the kind of, um, kind of practical lessons that you would need to run an estate. And that really uh, stood George Washington in good stead. His first job, which really came about because of the patronage system in Virginia and his, the fact that his older half-brother Lawrence, again, I can talk about Lawrence more, but I want to move on. Uh, Lawrence uh, married into the Fairfax family. He married Anne Fairfax. And because of that, he and George had an entree into Belvoir and this magnificent estate that it's such a tragedy that it burned down in George Washington's lifetime. It would be so wonderful to see it today because the Fairfax families were, so, were such a great and powerful family. That entree into that family got Washington his first teenage job, which unlike uh, for most of us, certainly for me, it was actually a good teenage job. <laughs> it was one that, that actually taught him uh, principles that he was able to put to good use later in life in surveying, becoming a surveyor. And uh, Washington took to that like a f the proverbial fish to water. Surveying was a detail-oriented profession and uh, it allowed him to put his knowledge and education to use. 
it taught him just as his time with the Fairfaxes did, the Fairfax family's wealth was based on land. And in entrepreneurship, of course, it should be needless to say, a good entrepreneur does not simply go around looking for the piles of gold that are sitting there on the ground because they're generally not that visible. Anybody can do that, but it's about seeing the potential that's locked within, the hidden potential that other people may not see, and bringing that out. That's what Washington learns about the land, is seeing the potential that is, is locked within. Now when George uh, goes off to the French and Indian War, uh, it's, it's an interesting experience for him. One thing I would emphasize here is that a fundamental trait of Washington's character that, that I really didn't see at first, but has become more and more apparent to me as time goes on, is that he was a combat veteran. And I take that in, in the sense that unlike most media treatments of that topic today, when the media looks at combat veterans, they tend only to see them in the one-dimensional sense, and they think about trauma, and they talk about trauma, which is certainly there for many of them, but they, they tend to think that's the defining aspect of being a veteran. In fact, with Washington, as for, as for other veterans, as I understand it, it imparts a broadness, a wisdom, an understanding of life and of conflict and of what war does to people and to societies at all levels that it certainly does for Washington. He develops an understanding from episodes such as the Battle of the Monongahela in 1755 where he was put in charge of leading a defeated British army off the field in the middle of the night where he's the only unwounded officer left on the field. In fact, he's not really even an officer, he's an aide de camp. But he has to lead this army off the field. He, he was, like many veterans, he was very reticent to talk about his experiences later on, but one, that was one thing he did mention when his uh, aide de camp, later aide de camp David Humphreys, uh, wanted to write a biography of George in the 1780s, he asked him to give some information on the French and Indian War, and, and George wrote that he would never forget that night of leading the troops off the field and the cries of the wounded and the, the, uh, the suffering, but also, I think, between the lines, the comradeship. Uh, all the different aspects of also what war is fundamentally for those who serve and those who do not serve at the front, how the details matter, how the simple things like eating and drinking and shelter and clothing matter, and also how pay matters. Uh, that's the very first thing he does afterwards when he's put in charge of the Virginia Regiment is he makes sure that pay is there for his officers and for his men. He later says, uh, and he didn't invent this phrase, but he certainly understood its truth, that money is the sinews of war. So moving on ahead from the French and Indian War, another thing we can discuss later on, when he returns, uh, George marries Martha. And here again, the concept is, is usually repeated. It, it annoys the heck out of me that uh, people say, oh, George Washington married well, or he married Martha because she was rich. Now, what does that do? Among other things, first of all, it makes George very mercenary. I don't necessarily have a problem with that. At times, he could be very pragmatic. But it removes agency from Martha, and it implies that she was there in a swoon waiting for some man to come and carry her off uh, as the most eligible widow in Virginia and all this wealth is just lying there and she's waiting for some handsome man. Uh, in fact, Martha herself, the, the wealth that she brought to the family and to that, I think is, is less visible at the beginning. Uh, we tend to calculate and look at all the money that she got from the, from the Custis family, uh, from Daniel Park Custis, her late husband. What about the wealth that she brought as an individual? And one aspect of that wealth was she shared with George a vision that 
We as partners have a responsibility to act as stewards of our wealth and our possessions. She had children of her own, two who survived to adulthood. She would have grandchildren. George certainly hoped he would have children with her as well. But they both had the same thought. You don't squander what you have. Nor do you simply just hold on to it, but you develop it, you increase it, you enhance it, magnify it, so that you can pass down a great legacy to your family. Uh, and even more generally, they are very uh, community-minded people, and they think ter in terms not just of their own wealth, but in terms of enhancing and improving their community. Uh, and you see this in their partnership at, at Mount Vernon and how it works. They work together. She's a great manager. She knows how to take charge of things. And in those days, particularly for the larger estates, this is not a 1950s family where you know, the husband will go off to work and the wife makes use of all these automated machines and she does the ironing and the washing and makes dinner and, you know, goes and hugs her husband when he comes home. It's not that at all. She has got to be tough. She has got to take charge and manage what really is an enterprise, a broad enterprise. Uh, that has many different aspects. It involves labor allocation, it involves accounting, it involves business decisions being made day by day. And George, as you know, spends a vast part of his life away from home. Martha certainly spends a lot of that with him, but a lot of the time she has to be there and she needs to, to work with his farm manager and keep things going. So um, it really is a partnership. Now Mount Vernon is, is interesting. Uh, George comes into Mount Vernon after Lawrence's death and the death of his wife and young daughter. Uh, it's a rather convoluted affair, but eventually he gets Mount Vernon. After he marries, he has an estate that essentially is, is still based on the tobacco system. And there are a lot of problems with that. Very briefly, tobacco is, first of all, it's very wasteful of the land uh, and its nutrients. What they would do is they would plant tobacco. Tobacco would quickly drain the soil. Then they'd go and they'd clear more land and plant more tobacco and move on. Very inefficient, very wasteful. It's also very labor intensive. It requires a lot of labor to manage and to cultivate tobacco. But, but primarily from George's point of view, when he looks at tobacco, the thing that, that really bothers him is that it is completely integrated into the British colonial mercantilist system, which is based on credit and results in debt. And what this means, very briefly and very simplistically, is that an American farmer, planter, grows tobacco, sells it through British agents who ship it on British vessels to Britain and sell it on their own account throughout Europe. Americans cannot do that themselves, and what they get in return is credit. Now, one of the worst things about credit is that, which they use to buy more British goods, is that the Virginia gentry, of which Washington is a member, is all about conspicuous consumption. If you want to belong to the gentry and you want people to see you as a member of the gentry, you need to show off. And the clothes you wear, the, the carriage that you ride, the type of parties you throw. And so you tend to use that credit to buy baubles and fripperies and, and all kinds of luxury items. And the result is massive debt. We tend to think, again, that, well, George had it made, didn't he? Especially after he married Martha. What does he have to do? He just has to kind of relax and enjoy the, the fat of the land. In fact, what he saw every day is that he and his peers in the gentry system were always one step away from ruin. And what brought them to ruin again and again was debt. Fire sales are happening all the time, or what they called in those days lotteries. A, a planner goes bankrupt, and he has to sell all of his goods through a lottery. So George Washington shifts to wheat. 
Now, I could go into that more. It's a very sudden shift, but it's profound, and it is the source of his wealth later on. That, that business decision he makes is very fast. He studies it carefully, then he says, this is what I'm going to do, and he does it. Wheat has many effects. He gets entirely abandons tobacco, moves entirely to wheat. One of the effects is that it's not nearly so labor intensive. That means that Washington can allocate the enslaved people, and I'll talk much more about slavery in a minute, the enslaved people on his estate and the workers and, and the other people, he can have them do other things, as in produce their own clothing, as in harvest and produce their own food, as in develop a big blacksmith operation, as in develop other enterprises that allow them not only to become self-sufficient, but to sell all over the region and even into the West Indies. Uh, flour, George Washington brand flour, which he decides is going to be the best possible flour, renovates his grist mill, invests a lot of money into it, is noted for its quality. And he earns quite a bit of money by, by selling that abroad. I'm going to skip ahead and move to the Revolutionary War uh, because I want to focus more for the remainder of my talk on that and his presidency. And here again, I'm only going to draw out a few major principles and we can get to the, to the details later on. George Washington is commander in chief. Now I'm, gonna, I'm going to digress a little bit from the entrepreneur topic to, to make a couple of points here. Why does George Washington become commander in chief? We tend to assume and I hear it over and over again, and has been assumed for a long time, that he really wanted the job, that he was, he was massively ambitious. And people say, look, the man wore his uniform to the Second Continental Congress. He must have really wanted the job. Oh, my goodness. What an ambitious guy he was. He wants to be top dog. He would have had to have been pretty stupid to have craved the position of top dog simply because he thought it would bring him fame and fortune in 1775. Because any sane thinking individual who looks at, whoop, pardon me, who looks at the, the situation in 1775 is going to say, this is not really a good prospect. Look, Great Britain, incredibly powerful empire arguably the most powerful empire the world had ever seen since the Roman Empire at that time. Very powerful army, very efficient, very effective army, an absolutely dominant navy, an established system of constitutional monarchy and effective government, despite, of course, the democratic disputes that happen uh, in that government. It functions very effectively with a parliament. They have an economy that is ridden with debt, but is nevertheless very you know, established and is based on a very profound national wealth. Great Britain has just gone through an agricultural revolution. They're on the cusp of an industrial revolution. It is a very wealthy country. What do we have to put against that? We have no government. We have no economy. We have no navy. We have no army. And we need to invent all of these things while we're going up against this immensely powerful empire that did not win its empire by accident. They didn't, didn't just fall into this, this empire. They won this empire. So even with all the logistical difficulties, which were real, 1775, it does not look like a good prospect. Why, why does Washington take the post of commander-in-chief. I need to stop puffing into the microphone, pardon me. Why does he take the post of commander-in-chief? One, because he believes in the cause. That's, that's really important to remember. We talk so much about ambition, we forget the fact that he really believed in what we were doing. He passionately, deep down, believed this was the right thing to do. And for him, incidentally, and I can talk about this more if you like, it was about economic independence. 
was the, the primary motivating factor. He thought much less about the po political angle than he did about the need for economic independence because he thought the British colonial system was holding us back when we're on the verge of takeoff. And the rules and restrictions were keeping us from achieving all of the things that prosperity brings to a society. It was holding us in thrall. But he really passionately believed in it, and he believed it was worth fighting for. Okay? The other thing he thinks, and this is again fundamental to his way of thinking, is that if you believe in something, and you believe in a cause, and you are a member of a community, and that community's cause is your cause, it is your duty to place yourself and all of your attributes, abilities, and resources at the disposal of your community. I don't say nation yet because we weren't really a nation yet, but as his understanding of the collective cause, he must place everything he has at that cause's disposal, whatever it costs. The third element is Washington's humility. Here I, I completely go against the ambition. It's actually humility that tells him to take the position. And humility, as I often talk with teachers about this, uh, ask, ask any of your students at any grade level, which one of you is the most humble <laughs> here? That's not, gonna, that's not gonna fly too well. Uh, with most of them because their understanding of humility is, oh, I'm not good enough, oh, I just want to be left alone, don't call on me for anything, I can't do anything. That's not what humility means. Humility means you see yourself as you are. A realistic self-judgment and self-appraisal is a fundamental part of being a human and a citizen in Washington's view, and he's really good at it. He doesn't admit his flaws too well to others, but he sees them himself. And he sees, what am I? How can I most help the cause? It is as a soldier. Because that's what I'm best at. Not perfect, but I'm best at. It's what I understand. I understand what war is. And incidentally, being a veteran, he understands what this war in many ways is going to do and what it's going to bring. He is not like many of his contemporaries in Congress. Aha, we all believe in the cause that is sufficient in of itself for victory. Like people like our good buddies Patrick Henry, John Hancock, the rest who have no understanding of military life and of war. They believe, as do most of their contemporaries, that it is our cause that will bring us victory and it is our belief in that cause that will bring us victory. Washington says, uh-uh, that's very important, but that's not what's going to bring victory. So his self-appraisal says, I am a soldier and I believe that if he had been tabbed for a position as quartermaster general, as colonel, as major general, he would have taken whatever his country asked him to do. That was what he was saying in wearing that uniform. It was duty, responsibility, and honor as he understood it. Now, um, how did when he be, once he became commander in chief, how did he see victory? And I'll say just a few points here. I'm not going to get into the battles and campaigns. But more about his strategic vision. First of all, why do you fight a war? Do you fight a war with the concept that we will achieve victory? Really, think about that. Whatever the cost? Is it really whatever the cost? What if you achieve victory at the price of ruin? Which has happened before and will happen again. Meaning you defeat your enemy, but you find yourself at the end of that battle sitting, or that war sitting on top of a heap of ashes. That's not why we're fighting. Washington says you have to have an understanding of what you're fighting for at the beginning of any war, of any conflict. What are you fighting for? What are you hoping to get out of this? What we're hoping to get out of it, why are we fighting? for the freedom to establish our own prosperity. 
Now, in order to be able to establish our prosperity, we must have the foundation for a well-ordered, peaceful civil society. That means a government, that means an economy, that means the foundations of commerce, domestic and international commerce. That means you fight this war in a conventional way so that you can preserve and develop that functioning civil society. This is not a war to the bitter end. This is a war that's fought while preserving our society and developing our society. Thus, war fought according to strict rules and a strict code. We will not plunder our own people. We will not usurp the civil authority. We will not fight a guerrilla war. And he had that option. It was advocated to him at the beginning of the war. Let's fight this as a guerrilla campaign. He was not a Fabian warrior who was seeking to outlast the British and to kind of fight them on the, you know, you know in the guerrilla sense. But he wanted to end the war fast, as fast as he could. Time was not on our side. He believed that fundamentally. And in fact, the, the facts bear that out. Another thing, and, and this is the last thing I'm going to say about the Revolutionary War. We can talk more about it. But, but there's another really important principle here is during the Revolutionary War, Washington begins to talk about communities of interest. And what he means by that I think really runs counter to how we usually think about the Revolutionary War, and particularly when we teach it. Um, and I, I would suggest this to you as educators, that when you teach the Revolutionary War, and this, this applies to many other areas, don't simply divide up your, uh, the population into patriots, undecided, loyalists. Think about it visually for a second. I was imagining this and I was talking to teachers yesterday at Mount Vernon. If you divide up your classroom and you say, okay, such a percentage, let's say 60% of you are patriots, you go over there. Say 20% are undecided or 30% are undecided, you go over here. And 20% are loyalists, you go over there. That's how most of Washington's contemporaries thought at the beginning, that these are fixed boundaries. You either believe or you don't believe. And the patriots are going to keep fighting because they believe in it. The loyalists are going to keep